Okay, guys, so I'm going to talk to you about William Blake. I'm going to give you the AO3, the background. Uh, you need this very much in order to understand this poem. It's a very dangerous poem because Blake's style often looks childlike and simple, almost like a limerick or a nursery rhyme, but it often has incredibly hidden depths. And Blake, I think, is possibly the most difficult poet that I've ever studied, okay? Now, I'm going to start off with this quote, no bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings. And I think this is a very important quote because it shows that Blake believes in the reliance of individual vision. This is what makes him a romantic. He doesn't believe in a collective or social vision. In every single way, Blake is unorthodox. He's a Christian, but he's an absolutely bizarre Christian who reinterprets the Bible. He despises the established church. He sees it as evil, a kind of antichrist church. And he believes that the individual must find God within. So there's so much emphasis upon visions and on a platonic idea of life. That means that the images you see with your eyes are not the true reality. The inner vision is what's more important. And so much of Blake's poems is about getting back to this inner vision, okay? So he was a painter, a printmaker, very much unrecognized in his life, but today he's seen as one of the greatest artists and one of the greatest poets within the English tradition. Um, the romantic idea, as I think you know, is comes towards the end of the 18th century. Okay? It's characterized by a focus on the individual, the individual emotion. It's often a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, okay? And in Blake's case, he actually refers to factories as dark, satanic mills. So Blake hated the coming of industrialization. He looked for a much more pastoral idea, an idea of man in a pure state of nature, a kind of Garden of Eden is what he looked back to, okay? He's often placed as being with the other Romantic poets, uh, Wordsworth, Courage, Byron, Shelley, and Keats. I think he's much more problematic than that. He's much more un unorthodox than them. And I think that's as I'm going to show you, because he invents so much of his own mythology. He's so unique that you could say he's nominally a Romantic, but you'd have to say he's an extremely um, unorthodox uh, Romantic. Like the other Romantics, they try to get away from more elitist, clever language. We've just looked at the flea and metaphysical poetry, and you've seen how linguistically clever it is, and how John Donne is showing off all of his learning and his <coughs> philosophical knowledge and his ideas of conceits and linguistic play. You will never find that in Blake. He writes with the simplicity of diction, but he uses very dense symbolism. So as I said to you when I started this talk, don't be deceived by the simplicity of the language and the diction. In fact, there are great depths of meaning. So as I said before, Blake created his own system of mythology and literature and philosophy and art. He reinterpreted the Bible. He invented characters like Urizen. He had different names for God. So when Blake was thinking about Christianity, he wasn't expecting people to read the Bible and do what they were told, etc. He believed in a creative interpretation of the Bible. And the notion that priests or the institutional church could tell you what to think, he absolutely despised. Uh, his biographer remarks on Blake's character, you might call him a solid maniac or a solid liar, but you could not possibly call him a wavering hysteric or a weak dabbler in doubtful things. By this, what he means is that Blake systematically made up his own theology, his own mythology. Now, in our poem that we're going to look at, um, what's very important is the Garden of Eden. And so in the Bible, you need to know that the original Garden of Eden was given to uh, Adam and Eve as a place to enjoy. So mankind had a direct relationship with nature. What's very important in the biblical Christian story is that Adam and Eve made love freely. They were naked. So you have this kind of naturist idea of life. Blake himself, when he lived in Hackney, often was naked at home. So he saw this kind of nakedness as a state of innocence, and he believed that in the idea of, of 
the fruitfulness of sexuality and he despised the established Christian church as something that tried to make sexuality dirty and wrong. Now, in the Song of Songs, uh, it's, it's a highly erotic uh, poem from the Bible in which um, Solomon actually celebrates his sexual relationship with his wife and he speaks very erotically of her and they have this kind of joyous sexuality. What Blake despised is that the Christian church tried to make this more into a relationship between man and God rather than between man and woman. They tried to reorientate the relationship uh, from that of sex and flesh to being a spiritual and joyous idea. And Blake saw this as a corruption of what the Song of Songs actually meant. Uh, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, you will know that they had this uninhibited sexual expression. And this is what Blake looks to get back to in many of his poems. But he believes that the church and other institutions have corrupted mankind. Now, if you know anything about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you will feel here a parallel with Rousseau. Rousseau, who believed that, that uh, in the natural man, that in nature people were closer to the biological rhythms of their true life, that society, with all of its laws and repression, took us away from our natural state of being. And in the Garden of Love, you will see that this poem actually comes from the songs of experience. In the songs of innocence, which go uh, alongside the songs of experience, you often find a more positive tone that celebrates uninhibited love, childhood, and the state of nature. In the songs of experience, which goes together with it, what we find is the more negative side of life. Many of the speakers, like the chimney sweep in the songs of experience, speak with bitterness and cynicism. So there's a much darker tone. So it's very important that you know that the poem, The Garden of Love, is central to the songs of experience, as it marks the psychological passage from childhood innocence to adult experience. And in it, what you will see is the villain in The Garden of Love is the church, symbolized by the priest dressed in dark black, and by the chapel, which is in the middle of the green, and is there as a corrupting, inhibiting, coercive force that takes mankind away from primitive joy and sexual expression. Each of the poems are illustrated, and in the actual illustration of the Garden of Love, I'm sure you can all see it there, what is happening in this particular illustration is these characters are drawn in kind of grey, black. They're kneeling down. They are. A, it's all about abeyance to God. They're reading from a book. They seem to be guilty. They seem to come out of the Christian tradition that Blake despises, the Christian tradition that represents mankind as needing to abase himself before God, a, a God that is angry and demands obedience and demands the rule of law, etc., so all of these ideas are antipathetic to Blake. He absolutely despises them. This is quite interesting so that you can see Blake never allowed his poems to be published without him coloring each of the plates. Can you see? If you look up at the screen now, you can see Blake was an engraver. So each of these figures would have been engraved. And then Blake insisted on hand coloring them. That's because he did not believe that the poem should ever be separated from the illustrations. He believed that the words and the images and the text and the coloring and design were one artistic product. So Blake would hate the way in our anthology today the poems have been transcribed onto a naked page and they taken away from his illustration, which he believed was absolutely intrinsic to the meaning of it. Okay. And now... Right, so we're talking about the Garden of Love. We've already done the AO3 idea of the context. I've told you about the Romanticism and Blake's peculiar brand of Christianity, his hatred of institutionalized religion, and his preference for a Rousseauian idea of the natural man. Here is the poem. 
I went to the garden of love and I saw what I had never seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. Now you recall the songs of, of innocence, the first idea would have been the child playing on the green. But here the child goes to the green and he finds that a chapel has been built. Okay? And the chapel is going to be a symbol of all that is dark. It is the symbol of institutionalized religion. The garden of love should be a place of uninhibited expression. The green, of course, has many meanings. First of all, it is common land. The term green used to mean a place that hadn't been built up, a place where you could play that was owned in common. It goes back to many evil traditions of land which is not owned by private individuals or the crown. But unfortunately here, the land has been taken over by the church. We know that Blake despises the established church because he believes that it colludes with the powers that be, with religion, with king, and with the army. So here we have again this very simplistic style. We have first person narration, don't we? And it seems to be a kind of childlike persona. Also, what's interesting here, he says, I saw what I had never seen. Remember that emphasis I told you that Blake is on, on vision, on seeing things for the first time. So like all Platonists, Blake doesn't believe that true vision happens with your eyes. It happens with intuition, with a looking with your eyes and your soul together. So, if we go on to the second stanza, you'll notice that they were written in quatrain somewhere, in very simple diction, as I've said before. And the gates of the chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. Thou shalt not seems to be very biblical, doesn't it? Okay. It's about the idea of what's forbidden for working. And you listen to the diction, it's very harsh. It sounds like a kind of official proclamation. And this is the way that Blake tends to see the law as coercive, as about forbidding people to do things. The chapel is shut. Now, in Blake's view, religion should always be open. There should be no element of private property or locking people out. But here he says, so I turn to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore. Now that's a beautiful image again, isn't it? An image of Eden. But what he sees now is that what he once saw, he doesn't see. The final stanza says, and I saw it was filled with graves. So you see the juxtaposition between this beautiful imagery of Eden with this vision, this truer vision. Remember what I said about the inner eye, seeing things symbolically. And instead of seeing the flowers, what does he see? He sees lines of graves, tombstones where flowers should be. So all of this imagery of death. And this is the way that Blake sees that society has been corrupted. Even on the green, which should be this place of innocence, this place of leisure, this place of common ownership, this celebration of nature's fertility and love. Instead, it has been appropriated by the dark forces of the church and state institutions. And here are his hate figures, the priests in black gowns. Again, this kind of death-like imagery, isn't it? We're walking their rounds. And so you'll notice now that in the final stanza, we lose the end rhyme, don't we? Earlier, we had the alternating rhyme, didn't we, between a green sea, didn't we? And uh, we had boar and door. But now we lose the rhyme, and the rhyme becomes internal to the lines. So we have the rhyme of gowns and rounds. That beautifully gives an idea of mindless routine, doesn't it? Why are they doing these rounds? They sound more like policemen, don't they? Are they thinking as they do this? No, it seems more like a mindless ritual, a routine without meaning. And I think that this is key to Blake's idea of the modern world, that people simply do things that they're told, that modern power is coercive, that nobody understands their religion, that it is all about conformism rather than about the inner person deciding meaning themselves. 
And the final line is an absolutely fantastic line where he says, and binding with briars my joys and desires. So we have briars and desires, wonderful. So desires, the idea of someone's personal choice, etc., is defeated by briars, a nasty, close term. What are briars? They are thorny bushes. And binding, Blake so often uses imagery of binding, of chains, etc., in perhaps his most famous poem, uh, London, he refers to the mind-forged manacles. Mind-forged meaning the manacles aren't really there. The chains aren't really there. People put them there because they do what they told. So it's almost a Marxist belief that people's minds are being controlled by people in power who interpret the Bible and religion for people. Here, the, the speaker is bound with briars, with thorns, and that takes away his inner choices, his desires for freedom, for sexual freedom, his natural self has been cancelled out by the socially coercive, socially constructed self. The final thing I'll say, of course, as well, is that briars and thorns may very well be a kind of Christ-like reference to the thorns that were placed on Jesus' head. So the thorns within the semantic field of religion often have this dark association with Christ's suffering. And so we end with this incredibly dark view, which explains why this poem belongs in the songs of experience. This voice, the message, is cynical, one of despair, and one in which a place that he has fond memories of has now been contaminated by this terrible institution represented by the chapel.